Well, God bless you, and welcome to this class called The Final Words, a study of the book of Revelation. Of course, we're going to begin in the book of Revelation, if you want to turn there in your, in your uh, Bibles. And uh, there's a comprehensive set of notes that goes along with the class. If you're webcasting, I, I was told that we would have this available on the computer so you can download the information. Um, the book of Revelation was, was written, written by John, the apostle, the apostle John. And um, John is the one that is referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved in the Gospel of John. That phrase is used quite a few times in the Gospel of John. It says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we come to understand that that is the apostle John. And uh, he is the one that was laying on Jesus' bosom at the Last Supper, who asked which one it was that was going to betray him. It's uh, this John that in Acts chapter 12, uh, his brother James was martyred by Herod. So he went through uh, this uh, terrible ordeal of having his brother killed. Um, and uh, he is writing this. He's in the city of, he's in the location of the island of Patmos. He's an older man. He's one of the last of the apostles, if not the last apostle that was with Jesus. Paul is already dead when this is written. Peter is already dead. And uh, so it's believed that this, this epistle was written. There's a, a great uh, uh, variety of uh, opinions as to when it was written. Some say as early as uh, 70 A.D. And uh, most people believe it was written around 90 A.D., I personally, I, I don't, I'm not sure one way or the other. I could go either way. Um, and um, it has a lot of wonderful information in, us, in it. And, uh, in this map here, it gives you some understanding of uh, the seven churches that the book is addressed to. If, if you see, if you look at the map, you'll see the first uh, city is Ephesus. That's the first church that is addressed in, in, uh, in the second chapter. Then after Ephesus is Smyrna, and then after Smyrna is Pergamum, then from Pergamum, Thyatira, Thyatira, after that is Sardis, and then uh, Philadelphia, and last, the last of the seven churches that is addressed is uh, Laodicea, and if you'll notice that Laodicea is right next to Colossae. Colossae is not a church that is addressed in the book of Revelation, but of course the book of Colossians was written to Colossae. When uh, John wrote this, when he received the revelation about this, he was in the island of Patmos. You see that white marking on your thing there? It's in the Aegean Sea. The Aegean Sea is the thing that separates the sea that separates Turkey, modern-day Turkey, from Greece. And uh, then down at the bottom of the body, the body of water that you see there is the Mediterranean Sea. If you kept on going east on the Mediterranean Sea, you would run into... Uh, Israel, if you went west, you'd run into Rome, or in Italy, not Rome, but Italy. So uh, that's just to give you a little bit of a geographic perspective of it. Um, along with reading through the book of Revelation, in preparation for understanding the things that we're going to be covering in the class, it would be really, really valuable for you to read through the book, but at least before the next session that you would read the first four chapters of, of the book. Uh, and, and in accordance with, with the book of Revelation, you want to write this in your notes, other things that you would want to read in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 24. This is where Jesus spoke in the Gospels about the same, inf same information that's in the book of Revelation. It's in Matthew 24, it's in Mark 13, and Luke 21. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Then later on in the class, I'm going to encourage you to read the book of Daniel. I'm not going to do that tonight, but uh, the book of Daniel has corresponding information that also relates to what is written in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John. 
who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. The word revelation, the particular word that is the title of the book, the word revelation, is from the Greek word apokalousis, apokalousis, and it's, we also get the English word apocalypse from it. And some, some Bibles call this the apocalypse instead of calling it revelation. It, and uh, the word, the Greek word, what it means is an uncovering, a bringing to light of that which had been previously or wholly hidden, only obscure, or only obscurely seen. It's, uh, it's an enlightenment. It's, a, it's an unveiling. Uh, God, it's, it says in Hebrews that God has been pleased at various ways and in different times, according to Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, to make a supernatural revelation of himself, his purposes, and his plans. Throughout history, God has made known himself and his purposes and his plan. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, this is the last book of the Bible. So it, it goes... It should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyhow because it doesn't seem that people get it, that it's, it's very difficult to understand the book of Revelation if you haven't read the rest of the Bible. It, like any book, reading the last chapter of the book it doesn't make as much sense if you haven't read all the other chapters that proceed. Now, I'm aware that some of you sitting here and listening to me now have not read the whole Bible. And, you know, so you will be handicapped to a degree. Uh, you'll still be able to understand a lot. You'll understand a lot. But you will be handicapped to a degree because, I will, because there are so many allusions to things that previously were spoken. There's so many quotations from things that were previously scope, spoken. And we're not going to take the time to go back and read all of that. It would take forever. So, uh, but if you've read the whole Bible, you're obviously going to get more out of it. If you haven't read the whole Bible, this will maybe be an impetus for you to want to go back and start reading through the whole book. If you read through it once, I say read through it again. Keep on reading through it. Because, like, it is a conclusion. And it does bring to an end all of the things that are written prior to it. It's an excellent book. It really is. It has so much for us to learn. Now, what we've just read here in verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his bond servants the things much, which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Now, you look at this chart. What we just read is God originated the information. He gave them the information to Jesus Christ. Jesus then communicated it to the angel and then the angel told John, and John wrote it down, and now we're reading it. And that, that, is, that is not an unusual chain of, of uh, command, so to speak. That revelation originates with God. In the Old Testament, we, we see in the Old Testament that, uh, that uh, Abraham, for example, in chapter 18, he is uh, visited by three angels. And the three angels start communicating with the two of the angels leave. They go to Sodom where they rescue Lot from Sodom. And then, you know, Sodom is destroyed. One of the angels stays back and Abraham starts dialoguing with this angel. But the way that he speaks to the angel is, he says, Yahweh, will you not spare the city of Sodom if there are 50 present? And then, you know, Yahweh says, yeah, if there's 50. And Yahweh, will you not? And he keeps on talking as if he's talking directly to God. And you forget when you're reading it that he's really not talking directly to God. He's talking to an angel through, he's talking through an angel to God. He is talking directly to God, but there's a mediator, and that mediator is the angel. We see this also with Moses with the burning bush in Exodus 3.2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And you read that record, and it looks like he's talking directly to God, but he's not. He's talking to an angel, and an angel is talking to him. We see this also in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. Why, why the law then? It was added because of transgression, having been ordained 
through angels by the agency of a mediator. The mediator was Moses. The law that we're talking about is the first five books of the Bible. Now, when you go back and you read in those first five books of the Bible, you see that Moses has gone up to the mountain, and there's this communication between him and Yahweh, and there's this great going on. They're talking back and forth. But the whole time now we see from Galatians, it really wasn't directly with God. It was with an angel. And, and then the angel communicated to him. So what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation isn't odd, where it would come from God, and then, but what is odd in the New Testament is you have a new player in that you have Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was from God to the angel to the person or persons. Now in the, in the uh, book of Revelation, as well as all of the other uh, writings, especially in the book of Revelation, let's just say it that way, God to Christ, then Christ communicated it to an angel who told John, and then John wrote it down, and here we are tonight reading it ourselves. And it's, it's as if it came originally from God speaking it to us. And I tell you, as we get into this, it will, you will marvel, at least I have marveled, at how, how this is, it could have been written today. The information is so pertinent to our lives. It has so much to do with our day-by-day -day Christian walk, and it has so much to do with our times and, of course, it has so much to do with the end times. Uh, so, the frequent occurrence of the word angel, as it is in this first verse, really stands out because the word angel is written 48 times in the book of Revelation. It's only written 196 times in the whole rest of the Bible. In the, no, in the whole Bible, it's written 196 times. 48 times, it's in this one book. So if you round that off, you know, with 250, so it, you know, that's a lot. But it gives you an idea what the book of Revelation is about and how it works. What you get in the book of Revelation is an unveiling of what is going on behind the scenes. It's as if now at the end of the book, God takes off the veil and says, here's the spiritual reality of what has been going on and what will happen. So we see a lot behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see in the other books that are written in the Bible. You see it sometimes. You see glimpses of it. In Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1, you see little glimpses of God in heaven and little windows. But here in the book of Revelation, it's like we're given a bird's eye view of these many things that are these spiritual things. And then this phrase again in verse 1 where it says, uh, the things which must soon take place. Another translation says, the things that must shortly come to pass. I have to take some time to explain that to you, because that is an expression that, is, that reoccurs in the epistle. It's almost identical in chapter 22, verse 6, that this is the same wording, that, that the book ends with the way it begins. It's talking about things that will soon come to pass. And um, it's also language that's used elsewhere a lot in the Bible. And I wanted to give you uh, some understanding as to why that would be said. And the reason being is, is that if it was soon coming to pass, and this is 2,000 years later, and it still hasn't come to pass, we have to understand why that is. So what does this mean? And I, I've given you uh, four possible ways of considering this. The, uh, the first is, some of the prophecy took place in the near future, right after John wrote it, shortly thereafter, especially if this was around 70 A.D., or it, it doesn't matter if it was any time around that time. Some of the things that, that he spoke, the prophecy, did take place in the immediate or the near future. So very much like Old Testament prophecy, it has dual or repeated prophecy, with things reoccurring and yet to happen at the end of the age. You see this in the book of Isaiah a lot. Isaiah prophesies about things that are going to happen, and they happen in the immediate future, but they're also going to happen again, and then they're going to happen at the end of the world, at the end of the age. And I think that that's what you have here in the book of Revelation. That is one reason why he might have said what he said. It was something that was going to happen in their immediate future, 
but it's also something that could be repeated more than once or certainly at the end of the age. So what you have is when we study the book of Revelation and we get into it, we will see that some of the things have already happened that are talked about. Some of the things are in the process of happening. They're happening right now, tonight, they're in the process of happening. And then some of the things are going to happen yet at the end of the age. The second way of understanding this is it may refer to certainty of the events in questions. In question. God has determined them and He will speedily bring them to pass according to His time and not ours. Therefore, the emphasis is upon the quality of the time rather than the quantity of the time. Because with God, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So from God's point of view, it's been two days. That's another way of understanding this, right? And then uh, the third thing is, it could also mean suddenly or immediately when that time comes. Similar to what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, 30, 34, where he said, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. What I mean by that is that he, he said this a number of times in the Gospels. He said, the, the, these, things will not, these things will happen before this generation passes away. Now, people have wrongly understood that to mean the generation that he was talking about then. He, wasn't, he didn't mean that. He meant that when that generation happens, the things are going to happen quickly. And indeed, that is what the book of Revelation teaches us. There is a, when it comes to that time, at the end of the age, after the abomination of desolation is set up, it is a three and a half year period of time. And boy, it is loaded. Things happen quickly. Boom, 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 boom. Outrageous things happen in a three and a half period of time. So it could mean in that generation, it will happen quickly. And then the fourth possibility regarding this is, the fourth possibility is that the circumstances changed, so the revelation changed. As again is seen in the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied that such and such was going to happen, and then the people changed, and because they changed, it didn't happen. Something else happened. So there, there is that that possibility could enter into our understanding here too. I, I personally, you know, I think that there's a combination of the four of these things. Is, but I, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to teach this class. I'm not going to give you, I'm, I'm going to try to as much as I can to discipline myself not to give you my opinion. And I'm going to try to discipline myself to interpret what we're reading based upon the scriptures and not outside information. So I'm not going to tie it together with current events. I'm going to show you what the scriptures say and to get clarity as to what the scriptures say, since it is the last book of the Bible, we have the privilege of going back into the Bible to get clarity as to what things are being said. There has been gross, gross biblical interpretation processes violated when it comes to the teaching of this subject. Some of the stuff is, I'll point it out later on in the class maybe, I don't know if I want to waste too much time on that, to show you how crazy it can get. We don't want to do that. This is, a, this is the fact. Every generation needs to live as if the end is near. And every generation has had good reason to think that during their time, the end was near. Can you imagine how the people during World War II who had any understanding of the Bible when the Jews were being killed like that, how it must, whoa, we must be at the end. Or when they saw the Jews going back into Israel, how they thought, and, and, and going back 2,000 years, when the Romans did the things that they did when they destroyed, every generation has had good reason to believe that their time is that time when the end is near. Now I want to say this to you. We have more than all of them. Because they're all gone, and we're still here. <laughs> so if, if they were close, we are much more close. Joel said, Joel said that when the, the Spirit would be poured out, it would be the beginning of the last days. That's why Peter quoted it 
on the day of Pentecost, when the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, Peter said, this is like that which Joel prophesied about. And Joel said, in the last days, my spirit will be poured out. So when the church began on the day of Pentecost, it was also the beginning of the last days. If that was the beginning of the last days, surely today we are 2,000 years further into the last days. I think of the, the, I was taught this to understand two different Greek words, that of, if you look at a dog, woof, and you see the dog's head, and you go, that's the head is the, the beginning, and the tail is the end. Now, you look at a dog's tail, and you say, oh, well, that's the end of the dog. But, but there is a, that tail is, a, the Greek word centalia would be the end, but the tippy, tippy top of that dog's tail, the end of the end, would be the telos. That's, that's the end end. I'm certain we're on the tail. There ain't no question, of, there's no question about that. Where we are on the tail, I'm not, I don't know that. But uh, I know we're on the tail. And I know we're not at the tippy tippy tail of it because we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. <laughs> so, um, the end is near. Look at, look at your, uh, your notes or up here on the screen, like I said, this is not the only place in the book of Revelation where these things are written. I think these are very piercing verses, Romans 13, 11, and 12. These should, these should cause us to think, and this do, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awake from sleep, for now is salva salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. That's true. If you believed yesterday, it's nearer to you today, isn't it? The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is the way we're supposed to think and behave. This is what we're to believe, and it should influence the way that we behave. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, And the, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment, and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Corinthians 7, But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on, on those who have wives should be as though they have none. And you read that 1 Corinthians 7, he's, saying, he's not saying to be neglectful as a spouse. What he is saying is, what he is saying is, here, here we go. What he's, the door just blew open. It's no big deal. What he's saying, maybe, maybe that's a sign. It's a sign we left the door open. That's what this, that's a sign of. <laughs> what he's saying is, if you're married, don't get all lost in being married. Keep God first, live for God, and have the things of God be first in your life. Matthew 24, 42 says, Therefore be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Mark 13, Therefore be on alert. For you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, at the cock crowing, or in the morning. James 5, 8. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Children, in 1 John 2, 18, it is the last hour, just as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know that it is the last hour. It's the last hour. These verses, I put them in a box, I've taken the time to read them, they are worthy of your contemplation. They should weigh on you to the degree, and weigh on all of us to the degree of influencing how we think and how we behave. This coming July 18th, I'm going to be going to the Congo. And, or I'm going to Africa. I'm going to a couple of places in Africa. I'm going to be there until August 8th. Knowing that this is happening, I have done already many, many things in preparation for that day. I've had to get shots. I've had to get tickets. I've had to get, you know, make plans. I'm studying information. You know, I had to get visas and all sorts of different arrangements. I have other people coming with me. You know, there's a lot of planning that, that is involved with all of this. And, and uh, in preparation for that day that I know I'm certain is coming, as certain as I can be as a human, 
not knowing what God has in mind. And that's, I'm, 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 it's influencing my behavior today. And the closer I get to it, the more it will influence my behavior. It will begin to influence my diet. It's already influenced my prayer life. It will influence it more and more. It will influence a lot of other things. So that when I get to this location, I'm prepared to do what God would have me to do there. How much more so if I really believe these verses that I just read? How much more so should it influence the way that I behave and what I do? Rather than wasting my life on anything that is not important to this overall destination that God promises me is available for me to go to. Verse 2 says, Who testify to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. John's talking now. John testified to the end, testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. This, is, this terminology is used later on in the same chapter in verse 9, again in chapter 6 and chapter 12. As, again, as the last book of the Bible, there are hundreds of quotations or allusions to the rest of the Bible. We are often reminded of previous things like the tree of life and paradise, which is in the second chapter of the book. We have an allusion back to that. We have an allusion back to manna that they ate in the wilderness that's recorded in Exodus. We have a, an allusion back to Balaam that's in Numbers. We have an allusion back to Jezebel who is recorded in Kings. So there's all of these, these uh, quotations and allusions. What I mean by allusion, it's not a quotation, but it's, it's relating back to that, that time period. A remarkable, succinct compilation of descriptive information about God, about Yahweh, is set forth in the book of Revelation. He is, he is set forth, not that we gain information that we haven't learned before, but it's told to us in a somewhat different way. We're seeing it in, a, in a, a much different way in some cases. And also a graphic, unique description of Jesus Christ is shown in the book of Revelation. If you have not studied, well, if you've studied the Gospels, you've learned a lot about your Lord. If, but you haven't gotten the complete picture. To get the complete picture about the Lord, you've got to understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation reveals how Jesus is today, right now, and what he will be in the future. It really is, and it's not to be found elsewhere in the Bible. It's in the book of Revelation. So it's exciting to get a better perspective of God, and it's exciting it's, it's well worth every effort of our energy to get a better perspective of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen in this class as we move on into it. Verse 3, blessed is he who reads. Now you look at that, verse 3. If, you, if, you under, if you're the kind that underlines your Bible, I'm going to give you three words to underline. Blessed is he who reads, the word reads, and those who hear, I'd underline here, the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Again, we're told the time is near. Those three great words, R-H-H, -H, read, hear, and heed. They're, they don't mean the same thing. You can read something and not heed it. You can read something and not hear it. He wants us to read it, to hear it, and then to heed it to do what it says therein. To read it, to heed it, to read it, to hear it, to heed it. I'm going to say that five times real fast. <laughs> you know, what? this verse to me is one of the most encouraging verses as I start this study, because I've read the book of Revelation many times in the course of 40 years that I, I've been a Christian, and at, at first I was told that it wasn't to me, so you're not going to understand it. I was taught that it's for a people that are closer to that time, and they'll understand it, and you won't, you, you're not going to, so I never read it. Obviously not reading it, I did not understand it. Then as I grew and I matured in my understanding, I started to read it, and, but I, you know, I got lost in the imagery, and I, it just was overwhelming to me, and, and because I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear what I was reading, I was just reading it and not hearing it. 
And then as I've matured in it now, I am to the place, I think, of, of reading it and hearing it and heeding it. We have to come to the book with the understanding that God wants us to know this. He really wants us to understand this. He wants us to read it, to hear it, and to heed it. Well, he can't expect that if we're not going to understand it. So we can understand it, which is one of the, one of the verses that's repeated eight times is, listen to me, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Eight times that's repeated in, the, in, the, in this book, saying to us that God wants us to hear, but not everybody will hear. Unfortunately, our history as a people following our descendants back to Israel has not been very good. When God spoke to Isaiah, he commissioned him. He showed him a, a little glimpse of heaven too, or the throne room of God. He said to him, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. He told Isaiah that they weren't going to listen, and they didn't. He said the same thing to Jeremiah. Now hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but you do not see, who have ears, but do not hear. And then in Jeremiah 6.10, To whom shall I speak and give warning that we may hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them and they have no delight in him. Jesus when he spoke to them in parables, the, the, the apostle said to him, Jesus, why are you talking to them in parables? He said, the reason I'm talking in parables is because they have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have a heart, but they do not understand. So I speak to them in parables. But to you I speak plainly, talking to his disciples. The apostle Paul, the last chapter of the book of Acts, he quotes Isaiah also, because in that time, People didn't have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand. The question really comes down to this, that you have to ponder in your own heart and your own mind, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Do you have a heart to understand? I remember when I was a child, as a child, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I would get into conversations. Okay, I remember doing this to my mother. She would try, she'd be straightening me out, and I'd go like this. Because I didn't want to hear it. You've never done that either, right? And that's, that's what a lot of people do just that. They don't want to hear. If you come into this book of Revelation with that kind of attitude, it will be very limited as to what you will read and hear and heed. But if you come in with the right heart, you ask God to give you that kind of heart. If you ask God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear and a real heart to want to know, to really want to know God, to really want to know your Lord Jesus Christ, to really have a better perspective than you've ever had before, He'll give you that. He'll let you do that. Heavenly Father, as we come into this class, I pray that you would give us Give us hearts that are truly hungry for truth. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And protect us from the evil that would beset us from pursuing you. Keep evil and temptation from us. Open up our hearts. Father, help us to be people who genuinely love you and seek you. And if we do, we know you will be found. So, Father, as we go into this time, this is, this is going to take... Two months, Lord, to go through this. Eight sessions. We're not going to be able to do that without your help. Please help us. Strengthen us. Fortify us. And give us the heart that you want us to have. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you so that we might know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of your inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of your power. Open up our minds and our hearts, Father. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. These are listed in verse 11. We'll see them. Grace to you and peace from him who, who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits that are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Uh, this phrase, him who is, who was, who is to come, is uh, repeated again in verse 8, in chapter 4, chapter 11, chapter 16. It's a phrase that is repeated in the book of Revelation, but it's not used anywhere else in the Bible. The concept is found elsewhere in the Bible, but this phrase is not found elsewhere in the Bible. When Moses said to God, who do I say sent me? God said, tell him, I am sent you. I am is the Hebrew word, haya, H-A-Y-A-H. And haya means basically that which we just read in Revelation. He who was, who is, who is to come. That's what haya means. That's why he said, I am. I am is a pretty good perspective. No matter where you are on the spectrum, God is always, I am. He's always the great I am. If it's in the past, the future, or the present, he is I am, haya. Haya is, from the word haya, we get the word Yahweh. Yahweh is God's proper name, and it means the existing one, the eternal one. Again, another way of saying that is, he who was, who is, who is to come. He is the eternal one. He is the the uh, existing one. He always has been there. He always will be there. He's here now. And that's what a wonderful way of saying it. He who was, who is, who is to come. In the book of Revelation, that is repeated a number of times. It's not anywhere else in the Bible. This is the, the salutation that is given in the beginning of the writing here. Um, I, I wanted to show you these verses. In, uh, in Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are what? And then Psalm 10, of old you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. All of them will wear out like a garment. Indeed they are, aren't they? Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all become old like a garment and like a mantle, and you will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, but you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. How wonderful to keep this in view, to keep this perspective. Because what is written in the book of Revelation is difficult times. And in difficult times, John, is, his writings and his prediction of the difficult times to come, to, for him to stress the changelessness of God is extremely encouraging to us. For us to understand the eternal nature of the God that we worship, that's encouraging to us. God revealed the same kind of information to Moses when Moses started out in his journey, which was a very difficult journey. He, he showed him that he was the Almighty, that he was the everlasting, the, the ever-present, the eternal one. We need to know that. The seven churches in Asia, like I said, they're all listed in, in verse 11. And we should, we should consider this book, when we're reading it, we should consider it as we do all of the church epistles that we read. When I read the book of Ephesians, 
I understand that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians and he sent it to the church at Ephesus. But what, so I understand that it was their letter, but I take it as being written to Vince Finnegan. I read the book of Ephesians, I think this is written to me. I do the same with Philippians. I do the same thing with, I don't do that with Deuteronomy per se, but those church epistles in particular, I understand Deuteronomy has a lot of information for Vince. I take, well actually I do it with the whole Bible. I take it very personal. But especially the church epistles. Well this is another church epistle. It's written, it's written to Ephesus. It's written to Smyrna. It's written to Pergamum and to Thyatira. It is written to Sardis. It is written to Philadelphia. And it is written to Laodicea. It was written to them first, but it's also written to you and to me. And, and we're, to, we're to have that kind of attitude of rep, receptivity when coming to this thing. That's why I know we can understand it. You can understand Ephesians. You don't understand it the first reading through. You've got to work the book of Ephesians to understand it. Same thing with this. You know, you're going to understand, after we're done with the class, you're going to have a greater understanding of what you've had before. And then later on in life, as you study it more, you'll get more understanding. I haven't come to the full understanding of, of uh, Ephesians, or any book for that matter. You keep on growing in it. But you should receive it just as it was written to you. This is written to a, as we looked at the map, it's written to a region of churches. Just like the book of Galatians is the same way. You, you look at Galatians, it's the other side of Turkey. It's to Pergamum and to uh, uh, Iconium and uh, the other, Derby. The, there's a whole cluster of churches, but it's just addressed to the Galatians. It's the same thing with this, this epistle. And we should have that kind of attitude with it. The salutation that's given here is certainly a unique one. I'm going to stand up. The salutations are certainly a unique one. A unique one. You, you read uh, Romans and, and Corinthians and Galatians and all of these other ones. It says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, Paul, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the part I'm trying to remember. From God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. They're all the same. They all say the same thing. You come to the pastoral epistles, it's, it says, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be unto you. When you get to the pastorals, it's from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. And that's the only variation that you have in that. Now you come to the book of Revelation, and the salutation is completely changed. Look at, look, well, you know what I mean? The salutation is the introduction, right? It's, uh, verse 5 again, or verse 4, John, the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace, that's the same, and from him who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, and it goes on and says all this stuff about Jesus. This is a whole different salutation. And you know, he would change it up in the last book, right? And he did change it up. It's, it's not just from God the Father. He wants us to understand that it's from the unchangeable one. It's from the eternal one. Nothing has changed Nothing is going to change. He's not going to change. Things are going to change, but he doesn't change. And from the seven spirits that are before his throne. And we haven't had that before in the Bible. And, um, and we'll look at this later on as we get further into it. This, is, this appears four different times. And we don't know what that means at this point. We have to study as we go into the book to understand what they are. But I, I would like to say this at the offset or the onset, is that, is that uh, seven is a popular number in the book of Revelation. I mean, seven is all over the place. And the tendency is, is for people to take similar things and make them identical. And we don't want to do that. It says seven spirits, and then it says seven angels. And a lot of people think, well, angels are spirits, so it's the same thing. But we'll see in chapter 3, it's not the same thing. It's two separate things. So you don't want to, you want to be very meticulous in how you interpret things when we're going through. You want to be very disciplined to read what's written and not to, not to make things that are similar identical. And from Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us. I'm reading that fast. Slow down. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, and it lists five things about him. Number one, the faithful witness. There was nobody greater as a witness than Jesus. He always spoke God's word. He always did God's word. He was the perfect witness. From the firstborn 
of the dead. He's not the last, but he's the first. That's the second thing about him. The ruler of the kings of the earth, the third thing. The ruler of the kings of the earth. The fourth thing, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That's our Lord. He's the one that's talking to us. You know, this is, the salutation is coming. And, and then the fifth thing, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a salutation, huh? All of that stuff about Jesus, and we could go on and look at so many other things. The important thing I wanted to bring to your mind here is that that latter part of verse 6, to him, referring to God, be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The term, that phrase, forever and ever, another phrase that is repeated a lot in the book of Revelation, 12 times in this book. But it's not exclusive to Revelation. It's written elsewhere, and I want to I look at that with you. It says in Romans chapter 16, to the only wise God, are you looking at it with me? The only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever, amen. Galatians, to him be glory forever. Amen. This should be our perspective. This should be our aim. This should be what we want to be about, bringing glory to Him forever and ever. If you want to be a part of the kingdom, you've got to understand this is part of the deal. In the kingdom, you're going to be bringing glory to Him forever and ever. It should be something you want to do now. Bring glory to Him. Ephesians 3.21, unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. In 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. This is what it should be about for everybody, always bringing honor and glory to Him. 2 Timothy 4.18 And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work who, who will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Hebrews Equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Whoever speaks is to do so as one is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through His Son, to whom belongs the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then 1 Peter 5, 11, To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Sing with me. To God be glory. Great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Who His life. An atonement for sin. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Heavenly Father, show Yourself unto us so that we might give you the glory that is due you. As we go into this, this great epistle, Lord, please help us to understand so that our lives can be about bringing glory to you. You are glorious. You are holy. You are sovereign. You are the Almighty. 
You are the one true God. There is no one like you. There's nothing that comes close to you. You are everything that is right and lovely and just and good. And we praise you and we thank you and we give you glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. After the break, we'll come back and we'll continue.